Okay, so uh, I am Brian Cardell. I'm a developer advocate at Egalia, and uh, I we've been having this long conversation about the health of the web ecosystem. I've had different guests on, and this time I am joined by a colleague of mine. Hello, I'm Eric Meyer, um, also a developer advocate at Egalia, having joined more recently than Brian came on board, but happy to be here. Hey, Brian. Hey, how are you doing, Eric? I'm really glad that you're on here. Uh, I hope we do some more of these. I think this should be fun. Yeah, totally. Uh, if, you, if you don't know Eric, uh, he is the author of the CSS Definitive Guide, co-author co as of the latest version with Estelle mm -hmm. Whale. Yep. And congratulations to my co-author, by the way, Estelle, who just joined the Open Web Docs. Yeah, that's excellent. I'm really happy. Yeah, that, super awesome. That, that's a great effort. I'm, I'm really happy that we're involved and could help start that, too. Yeah. Uh, okay, so yeah, we have been uh, discussing the health of the web ecosystem, and we've discussed it from like lots of different angles. And uh, one that Eric and I have been kind of talking about recently, given a lot of things that have come up, uh, is sort of like uh, how is how are the communications channels in the ecosystem working? <clears throat> and a number of events, like over the past couple of months, and even some podcasts, like. Our friends Jake Archibald and Serma on the 203 podcast recently had a uh, Is Safari the New IE? The title makes you think it's one thing, but it's actually a lot more nuanced. And I like I appreciated the conversation in that. Well, I don't know. What do you think, Eric? Well, I don't think Safari is the new IE. I think Safari is Safari and IE was IE. But uh, it, I agree with you about the podcast, Jake and Serma's um, take on it. It was longer and more nuanced than its title would have suggested. Yeah, they, they they kind of dig into that question because it seems to be sort of like a almost a meme at this point. But we, we thought about, you know, how are the communications channels working and like, what are the impacts of that? Are there impacts to the health of the ecosystem? And I think, Eric, we agreed kind of it could be better, right? Yeah. Yep, uh, it could be better. So things have improved in a lot of ways. Everything is a lot more open. Everything is done theoretically in public. There still is a, a members list. I don't think right. that it actually gets any mail. The mail that I've gotten from it since rejoining uh, has has literally been things like, you know, reminders that, oh, hey, the we've been invited to the Color API workshop right. to participate. You know, it's just remind it's solely administrative from what I've seen. All of the stuff is there. Anybody can participate, but that's in theory. In practice, I think uh, developers, like they have questions, like why is this thing getting done and not that other thing? So why does it seem like this one group, uh, whichever group you happen to think at that moment is being very productive, whether that's the CSS working group or TC39, or back in the HTML5 era, maybe it was HTML, the what wig? Like, why are they being really productive and this other group isn't? They seem really stalled out or something. Like, they, they seem to be taking longer. Or like, what happened to that thing everybody was talking about that I thought was going to be a standard? Whatever happened to that? Or why is this thing being deprecated? Or even what does that mean? Which is the thing that happened recently. Yeah. You know, I think these are all really good questions. And while they technically have access to all of the information, I think one of the challenges is we don't we don't do a lot to sort of help them consume that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is this is something that I think a lot of people have noticed. Certainly, you and I have talked about it and and helped each other in certain points with, uh, you know, is the fact that a lot of these discussions don't happen in what just one place. Um, you know, so a change in WebKit might have been discussed in part on a W3C CSS working group GitHub issue. And then it might also have been discussed on a couple of rate, you know, WebKit bugs that have been filed in the public database. And then if you have access to radar, there might've been a radar that's not open to the public, but the, it, and, and so the, all of the steps that lead to a given change usually are not all in one place. They're scattered around and only a very few people will have followed all of those steps in the process. And then going back and trying to find them all is a challenge. It's, it's not easy often. 
Um, I think this is where the CSS working group, for example, shines. Most of the discussion, if not all of the discussion of a given issue will be on that GitHub issue. From a standards point of view, from a from a committee point of view, you can find most, usually you can find most of the information. It's not perfect. <laughs> this Sometimes things are scattered a bit, but they're usually centralized. It's when it comes to actual implementation that things start to get scattered because, you know, somebody will file a, a Chromium ticket that says, hey, the working group has decided to change the definition of this keyword to be this slightly different thing, right? It's been clarified. And so this needs to be fixed. And then there'll be a whole discussion in there about, you know, what does that mean for the Chromium code base? And what do we have to change? And here are the ref tests and the this and the that and the other thing. And then, you know, three other people will have filed related bugs and they're all, they, they're linked to each other. But as humans, the hyper and hypertext sometimes can be a little difficult for us, right? So, okay, I have to read here, but then I have to go over here and read here. But those two separate things have to be sort of integrated and then go back and read some more and then go to a different place. And yeah, that I think that's the challenge for a lot of people. I, you know, even even for us who have been, sometimes when we've been following this, you know, we've we've had these conversations where it's like, oh yeah, somebody described what that solution was going to be. Where, where was that? Right. <laughs> and I think the other aspect of that too is like, even if you are really, really motivated and you had, you know, infinity time to dig into this, the linking is imperfect, right? Yeah. Um, so you will find in all those cases where, it is on GitHub, those things are, you know, pretty well linked. Like this will say this links to this thing in this HTML repository, this pull request, and this pull request links then to this issue. And then, you know, that has a related three related issues in CSS. And right. in those in the if it's discussed in the working group, the bot posts the minutes to that issue. Right. <laughs> like but there are times it breaks down where like a little aspect of the conversation winds up over in WebKit or winds up over in Chromium or it mm -hmm. winds up, um, <clears throat> you know, not like not properly minuted where somebody references like, well, previously we discussed X mm. and like X might have 10 years worth, <laughs> worth <laughs> of history behind it. And you, like you don't have a link to any of it. Uh so kind of like sleuthing it out and understanding all that stuff is like not easy to be, yeah. to be fair. Uh, and so, you know, when we lack information, we, I think just like as humans, we like try to fill the gap somehow, you know, and we fill it with kind of like whatever seems to make sense. And sometimes like we fill it with narratives that, seem to make sense yeah we we interpret what we can see through the lens of what we expect and what we believe i mean for everything but also for this so yeah right you know if if you're if you've already come to the conclusion that google is evil right then when google does a thing and you don't have all of the backstory that gets interpreted in a well, what evil thing are they doing this for? Or if you've uh, if you've already decided that Apple doesn't really care about Safari and the web, or at least about standards, then when WebKit or Safari does a thing, you tend to interpret it in the in the sense of you know, well, you know, how why would they have done this when they don't care about the web? And that puts it that I mean that puts an internal spin on things. Yeah. It's not good for developers because they have all these questions that we just articulated. Right. But it's interesting to think about like how that combination of two things like impacts the health of the ecosystem. Cause I, I do know that there are cases where that has been counterproductive where, um, you know, nobody, nobody wants to be yelled at all the time. <laughs> like it is really tedious work to get one of these things, like herd all of the cats, get a little bit of everybody's time, advance things. And then it, you know, if people like get really angry with you for reasons that are like, maybe you, you know, you know, are just like not true, that can be really exhausting. And so I, like I've seen certain things like just 
get dropped. Right. And yeah, there's certainly, it's understandable if a developer at a company, you know, who is going to have a whole bunch of things that on their plate, right? They've got a very long to-do list. And if there's one item on their to-do list that gets lots of people yelling at them on Twitter and in bug reports and, you know, wherever else, they, there, there's, I'm, I'm certain there's a temptation to say, you know, I, I could work on these other things where nobody's yelling, <laughs> right? Um, I'm just going to put this one down for a while because I don't want to be yelled at again this week. Um, yeah. If at all possible. So I'm, I'm going to go work on other bug or, you know, other feature or whatever it is. And then, you know, as, as I think happens to all of us, once you put something on the back burner, often you never get back to that burner. Yeah. Like the, the more sort of negative sentiment is around something, the, the more people will reevaluate in a different way. Like, is, is this worth it for me or maybe for us, you know, to, right. to be the ones taking this, the brunt of this. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that's really interesting. Like on the one hand, it's really good that developers have that power, right? Like that we can like exercise the power to sort of shut down a bad thing. I think we could use help making sure that it's always the bad thing that's getting shut down. And I think there's a really good example actually that happened recently, a lens that you could view a specific thing through. So there was an announcement of a deprecation, and uh, we won't even dig into all of the stuff about that right away, but one tweet in there said, breaking changes happen often. As a developer, you should always be checking things in early channels. Now, uh, I know like where this came from, and I do know a lot of the history and stuff here. And so it's I'm interesting. I'm interested to hear that, that history and where that came from. Yeah, we can dig into that in a minute, but like the way that I read this as uh, all of the engines are constantly being updated, right? We, we like that about them, that they're constantly improving internals, that they're improving performance, that they're redoing their next gen layout engines. And there's a huge, huge surface area. And sometimes we mess up and we want to know about that as soon as possible. Like, I, I didn't think about that as like, we just stop shipping features all the time like I, that's the lens that i viewed it through it's not how it was largely received <laughs> no and that's right i i didn't even perceive it the way you did which is interesting um i now that you've said it i completely get it i mean basically it's google saying you know because we update every six weeks the way that everybody wants us to Sometimes stuff breaks and you should always be testing to make sure that we didn't break something. So like always be testing so you can tell us, hey, you broke this. You need to fix it before the next release is, I think, what you're saying where they were coming from. Whereas I read it as, hey, stuff breaks on the web all the time and we break stuff on the web all the time and you should be ready for that. Right. I think people read it as like we break things on purpose. <laughs> and that... I think it's not the case. I think that the, the case is everybody agrees that should be like really, 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 really rare and done with great caution. Um, there, this reminds me actually of a um, when I first kind of started getting into standards, there was this uh, the ECMAS specification. So, so this is what is really interesting is that we have all these controls to test now to make sure that we don't break things. But the number of things that are still under documented or that we like we have compatibility but we don't even realize where and how is still like it's way better than it was but it's still kind of imperfect and an example of this is when i first got into standards um i had been using them for a long time but uh when i first started contributing to discussions this story was relayed to me as i proposed a thing and that was uh the ACMA specification for the longest time uh, it had this concept of being able to iterate the properties of an object. And it said that uh, properties were iterated in no particular order, no guaranteed order to iteration. As long as you iterate them, you are spec compliant. Java also, by the way, had this in their hash map specification, said the exact same thing. It's basically the same idea. So they could they could be read back in the order they were created, or they could be read back sorted alphabetically. In either yeah. way, it's spec compliant. Exactly, exactly. Okay. 
Um, but it turned out that actually implementations did agree, but only to an extent. But people like learned this, like they just discovered it, you know, because they, they discovered that everybody returned stuff in the same order. Right. And so they built things based on that. Right. And when uh, some engine, I believe it was Opera first, but I believe the same thing happened to Chrome when they were when they were doing their implementation, they were trying to improve performance, you know, of their JavaScript engine. And they realized that they have this trick and they can actually make it faster if they don't maintain this in search and order. And so they did. And it was entirely spec compliant. Right. And like all kinds of things like Gmail just broke. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I, I should like, laugh, but that's funny. <laughs> I mean, we passed all the tests, though, right? Like, I mean... Uh, so that that kind of thing does happen. And so if you look at it through that lens, it's a completely different statement, right? Not at all bad in, in a way. It's kind of good. Um, and I think that's tricky because like this communication stuff is really hard and it, it requires like many individuals to understand the same thing. I know like Eric, you and I occasionally like throw here's a thing, a draft. <laughs> You know, uh, and we read drafts for other people and very frequently somebody is able to say, oh, uh, does that mean X? Uh, and you say, Wha what? <laughs> it is really hard to convey the thing that you mean and only that and not something else. Right. Yeah. It, it's a, it's basically impossible to write something in a way which cannot possibly be interpreted differently than the way you intended it. Right. Human language isn't that precise. And so like when you combine these these two things about mm -hmm. it being hard to assemble the backstory and communication being hard and like things it feels like can go kind of off the rails. Yeah. It is interesting to like look at a couple of these like the alert one. So like, like let's fill in here. It, like it seemed like there was a popular narrative that began to happen. Mm -hmm. that like Google just wants to break stuff. <laughs> right. And that really it was just a couple or maybe even one individual who just has way too much power. And just like on a Tuesday morning, he was like, let's break the web. <laughs> <laughs> Stroking a Persian cat. Is <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. Um, but it, of course that, I, I don't know that anybody really has that image in their head. That's a bit of a caricature <laughs> presentation, even for me, but but you get what I mean. Like that was sort of like the sentiment was a lot more closer to that. But the 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 real thing is that uh, is a real problem because um, these are very old APIs. They're like way from the beginning. I think these are like Brendan Eich, Dom Zero kind of yep. original inventions, and they present basically an operating system level dialogue. And it has been really hard to make end users understand that, even just that. It has been actually really hard to make end users understand domains. Yeah. And and sometimes it's like we, we, we think to ourselves like, oh, well, I mean, mm -hmm. just, just learn it. It's not that hard or whatever. But the number of vectors here is like actually really incredible. Yeah. Like when I started at Egalia, there was a, a, a thing that was fascinating to me where there was an open bug because... URLs can contain like Unicode characters. Yep. And so people would register like some like some domain with a lookalike character. So you would get like apple.com is what it looks like in like no because know. the A in apple.com was like mathematical A or something like that. Exactly. Right. And exactly. So it, it's mathematical A P P L E dot com. But if somebody clicks on a link in a spear phishing or just a regular old phishing email saying, you know, you need to update your information at apple.com and they even if they look at the url which lots of users don't and they're like yeah no it's apple.com all right click and they go to the site and even if they look at the url bar which most users don't yeah apple.com and like you say unless they literally like open the certificate information and even that who knows maybe the certificate says you know apple.com but it's using uppercase mathematical a or whatever yeah there's a lot of ways to fool non-savvy or even savvy users. I mean, that, I mean, having described that whole chain of things, how many of the people who are listening to this podcast would necessarily catch that? I would not. I mean, right. I, I don't, I don't think that like most human beings 
would like even yeah. very very tech savvy people would completely miss that right um yeah so the the real story here is that that is very difficult all on its own mm -hmm. uh it's difficult when you add uh that it's coming from an os level looking dialogue but where this gets really 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 snarly is with cross origin iframes so you've added a whole nother level of things that we we can't communicate like people don't understand this is not coming from the page you're looking at mm. It's something else. It could be from anywhere who happened to get a third party iframe into your page because from the third party, you can present something top level, not just top level, but top level and can be confused with an operating system or browser level dialogue, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, this has long been a known thing. This is not like a new thing. This has been discussed for a lot of years and it was nobody's first choice to want to just be like let's turn them off right yeah let's let's turn off prompts and confirms and alerts in cross origin frames which is what which is what google is had initially proposed to do it wasn't just to switch them all off for everything it was to switch them off when they cross origins yeah browser manufacturers have tried a number of things over the years there have been a lot of like really big efforts to try to make that clearer mm -hmm. um and we've tried a bunch of things and it would seem that those things have not worked. And so uh, there was a very real problem for real users here where, you know, we're talking about it in this few steps removed kind of way. But like, mm -hmm. I can tell you that I have family members and I know other people in the web community who have family members who like have had their identity stolen, uh, their bank accounts compromised, these are not like minor inconveniences. These are things that like ruin lives. Um, right. Lawyers yeah. and years to resolve. Mm. So, you know, in the priorities constituencies, users are first, right? Right. If we're trying to solve the problem for users and we cannot solve the problem for users, there is one sure way to solve it, right? Which is to turn it off. Yeah. If there's an attack vector, if you can block the vector, then... No more attacks can come on that vector, which is what Google was effectively trying to do with this cross origin, you know, alert disabling. You know, everybody went to their respective drawing boards and tried to figure out what is the way to do this. There was a bunch of study. They looked at the HTTP archive. They looked at like, I don't know, seven to nine million sites now. Hmm. They got data. Uh, that data is based on home pages. Mm -hmm. so it's not remotely adequate but it's informative and they looked at what was there and they said well that's actually surprisingly low so uh let's get some more information so then they added some instrumentation some stats counters to chrome these measure what real users encounter and and mm -hmm. use right mm -hmm. that was very very low for these specific ones these cross-origin yeah. iframe right like 0.006% or something of that magnitude. Uh, I think it was even less than that for the cross origin ones, but probably. Yeah. So they made this proposal, like, let's do that. Yeah. Uh, that proposal was a year ago. It wasn't like now. Right. Um, and there were discussions and there were people who went and did manual checking of, of things. A uh, hundred URLs that were encountered. They went and looked at them manually to kind of, you know, sanity check the the results. Mm. And in those ones that were reported that they had the cross origin, they, they couldn't actually make them fire. So they said, it's possible that like really a lot of these are like dead code, right? Mm. Like mm -hmm. they're, they're false positives. Mm -hmm. So the number is in, in practice probably even lower than what we see. Right. All the vendors said, we agree, that would be good. And if you do that, we will follow you. Mm -hmm. So it was not controversial. It was not a Google decision made in a vacuum on a right. whim. Like it took a very long time. There was a lot of research and, and like there was a way for you to opt out of this. Mm -hmm. um, but it turned out that that actually was insufficient. They shipped it and they were wrong. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's one of those fascinating situations of they Everything that went into the decision, they were right about. Mm -hmm. But 
once it was executed on, they found, you know, they discovered, they ran into the buzzsaw of the internet in part, but also, you know, I'm sure that there were cases they hadn't caught that got caught. And yeah, I th- I think the breakdown honestly is in, there's, there isn't really a way for developers like the, the global population of developers to know that these sorts of things are coming down the pike, right? Because there, there, there isn't, there isn't like a new service that slices and dices these things and sends them out to people based on their interests, right? So if you like, this is a sort of thing that from what I can tell, a fair amount of enterprise internet software, not internet, but intranet software actually does do sometimes. Like there are, I don't know, payroll applications that use cross they they do alerts and confirms and prompts and stuff across iframes. Whether or not it's cross origin, I mean, I'm not an enterprise expert, right? But there 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 isn't a news bureau that let people can sign up for to say I'm an enterprise software developer and send me stuff that touches on enterprise development, right? So that six months ago when this was under discussion, they could have gotten a little alert, not no pun intended, to say a little news item that says, hey. There's a discussion about removing these things in this situation and for them to then go and and be part of the conversation. And, you know, it's not like I'm saying that that's an easy thing to do. (laughs) And sure, there are, you know, we can say, oh, well, if they'd signed up for, you know, the, if they'd subscribed to this GitHub issue or they had alerts on this bug repository or whatever, then maybe they would have known about it. But yeah, no, there's, there's already too much, right? We're already drowning in information and yeah. even knowing where to go is often difficult or borderline impossible to figure out. I mean, I didn't know about this really until yeah. it happened and <laughs> I'm a lot further into these processes than a lot of people. Like when it broke, like the things that broke, once you heard the things that broke, you were like, well, that's really obvious. How did you miss that? <laughs> um, so the way that we miss that is twofold. So one is um, people are humans. Humans make mistakes. Uh, so mm-hmm. we will make mistakes sometimes. Uh, and to their to their credit, I think that the team actually received this feedback and they, you know, they delayed it. They said, we're going to go back to the drawing board, think about how we can improve this. Uh, but there's only so many things that we can think of. And to think of these things, we need more developers in the conversation right but this is actually surprisingly hard um yeah i have like i i started writing articles in like 2015 uh talking about this this sort of like there's a, there's an economic mismatch of you want better standards that means you need to be involved but standards move at such a slow pace and they happen in so many places that if you try the information fire hose is so big it's like that scene from the UHF movie where the kid gets shot across the room, right? Like, yeah. like it's a lot of information. You could not, you cannot possibly be ex- expecting every developer to handle this. And what is maybe interesting to know is like the the other side of the community knows this, and like we have tried a number of things. Some of them have been reasonably successful, but. It is amazingly difficult, actually, to engage the community in this kind of conversation. Yep. People are busy. What What else is interesting about this is, like, even if you manage to engage the community in a big way by creating a really simple A or B question, right? Mm. Like, which one is more important to you, A or B? Or how should it work, like A or like B? Right. Very frequently, when somebody asks one of those questions... Many people, when they answer the question, they think there is only one right answer to this, right? (laughs) Like no rational person could possibly think that the answer is B. It's clearly A. Right. And yet every time we have one of those and we present it and we get a lot of participation, it is astoundingly (laughs) 50-50. Yeah. That, I mean, in the end, that's a little bit terrible because it means that very frequently 
we have to make a choice in which roughly 50% of developers are going to think that's a bad choice. Right. And not understand how anyone could have possibly made that choice. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Now take that and sort of mentally reverse it. If you're a developer and say like, how do these standards bodies get consensus? Like, what does it mean? And how do they work? Like, this is very, very tricky because like for standards, there are not a lot of AB questions, right? Like they're yes. complex questions right? and lots of people from lots of perspectives. It's unsurprising that to build consensus, we make compromises. We know we need to get a thing and everybody is coming from a slightly different perspective and very frequently nobody gets exactly what they want, you know? Yeah. We wind up kind of, I think, often agreeing that reasonable people could disagree on something. <laughs> I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on any of that? I mean, no, you said it pretty much. It, it often comes down to a decision has to be made and yeah. there's no clear consensus. And you just, yeah, you do have to accept that some percentage of people are not only going to dislike your, your decision, but not even understand how you could have arrived at it. <laughs> That's a thing that you basically have to accept if you're going to do this kind of work, which I imagine is rough for lots of people. But at the same time, like I do feel like if we did better at communication on like both those ends, like if we could engage more developers, uh, we could get feedback earlier. You know, this is like one of the very first things in the extensible web manifesto is like, we need to tighten this feedback loop. <laughs> like this is a real problem because sometimes it takes, like a decade to get to where we're going to ship a thing. And only then do we learn, well, that's not what we wanted. That thing is terrible. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. way too late, right? Yeah. We can't, we can't start over now. Right. We got to fix that. And I, I do think that if we could somehow do better with the communication and help people understand why a thing was, it would be easier to have the kind of like, I don't like it, but I can understand reasonable people could disagree on this kind of reaction. Yeah. And I think, there's also the challenge that getting people involved earlier in the conversation sounds like a solution, but thinking ahead and trying to think through all of the side effects and the permutations is very much a skill. And it's not common and it's certainly not easy. Even if we'd had a whole lot of people involved in the discussion over alert prompt confirm, there would end up being a whole lot of, we'll just do this. And then you know, somebody explains all the reasons why that doesn't work. And then, you know, okay, we'll then do this other thing. And then someone else explains why all the reasons why that isn't going to work. And that, I, that would, I mean, that's very frustrating, right? <laughs> this is a thing that you bump into that also makes communication on these committees, even the public stuff really, really hard is that you will frequently see somebody show up and be like, oh, I have a big idea. Mm, uh, and it'll fix everything. But like, you're not the first person to have that idea a lot of times. Right. And you don't know the history or the reasons why that thing isn't being done or the, mm -hmm. the things that are being done instead. And yeah. so if that's, you know, one person every now and then, it's like easy to fill them in. But here too, you can't expect somebody joining the CS working group, for example, to know the entire 30 year history of every CSS <laughs> decision right. that's ever been made. Right. Yeah. So it, it's hard to participate without like bumping up against that. Yeah. See the long history of people proposing a parent selector in CSS, right. which we might actually be getting soon or something very close to it. But you know, it's, it's taken a very long time to even get to the point of coming up with an idea that might be workable. Yes. And the reasons why previous ideas weren't workable were often only obvious to people who have literally written browser engines and understand deeply the entire pipeline of how things happen in browsers. Yeah. So this is also really interesting is that like your perspective shifts. Uh, I know my own perspective has shifted. I see it differently. Right. And some of the challenges that you're talking about, like they're only obvious if you're an implementer. And, and sometimes the, the data that you have to work with about what you should and shouldn't work on is difficult too. And 
here too, like reasonable people can disagree. So like we run these sort of polls all the time. Like if you could do only one thing, what would it be? <laughs> right. And yeah. at the top of this list is like container queries has all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also did this really large survey, this MDN s survey, and it was big and scientific and like the thing that it turned up that was like most universally wanted really and and painful was like not new stuff so much as compat right and what's interesting about that is like we were able to identify through that that actually on a bunch of things that are you know like relatively newish and people are excited about there are still places in there where things are underspecified and we bump up against the edges of it and once we had the tests it seems that like no browser like they were all in the 60s basically like at the beginning of the year and so there's this effort we've been working on this year with others and you know in the past six months we've all upped that really really significantly i think they're all in the 90s now or 80 high 80s and 90s yeah but that that takes time because really strictly specifying and finding out where the edges are that we didn't even expect, you know. Right. But nobody asks for that, really, you know. Yeah. If you ask, if you ask people, what would you like to see done in browsers? They're gonna, like you said, container queries. You know, like cool new stuff. But then, if you actually go and ask, sort of more in depth, yeah, eventually they're gonna start saying. Uh, what really hurts me is that I do a thing and it works in two out of three browsers. I have to dump it because the third browser is important. That That's actually a really great segue into how I think maybe we could wrap this up and tie it back together with the beginning of this. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, our friend Jen Simmons, who's now a developer relations person at Apple, she was formerly at Mozilla and before that for a really, really long time, Everybody in the community knew Jen. She had a podcast and she did a lot of speaking and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but she asked this question that was like, hey, you know, I work for Apple and WebKit now. And like, what can we do to make WebKit better? Like, what what is the thing that, what would you focus on? Like, if you had the power to call a shot and say, here's one thing we're going to do. Like, what what would it be? And that actually generated a lot of not very productive responses. And in fairness, there were some productive responses, but there was also a lot of, you know, the best thing Safari could do is just die already. E effectively. I don't know if anyone said that in those exact words, but there was a whole lot of unhelpfulness. Yeah, because that does, I mean, that doesn't help. Well, first of all, Jan is a woman on Twitter and the web in general. She's had to develop a very thick hide for that sort of, you know, to ignore that sort of thing because that happens a lot regardless of w whether she's asking things on behalf of Apple or not. When you have someone who's saying, how can we make this better? Telling them something else, right? Not answering the question is rarely ever helpful. And I admit I used to do things like this. I don't, I hope I wasn't as, uh, as hostile as, as that, but you know, the thing where someone asks a question and you answer it in some, you know, uh, technically correct, but not at all relevant way. And I think we would all do a lot better to be more helpful. One, one interesting bit of helpful feedback that I thought, uh, Dave Rupert, uh, tried to respond to this and, and he said, I think that, you know, Safari is the new IE is, kind of a tired take it's not really helpful mm. here i have a person who is genuinely asking mm -hmm. so i want to try and give them some feedback so i thought i sat down and thought about it and i wrote this post you know right and he said i think a helpful way to answer this would be to tell you the things that like i'm frustrated with and they're largely where i have to do something to appease one browser god right uh, uh -huh. this special way I have to create this sacrifice to make something work in IE6 or, you know, whatever browser it happens to be. And I think that's an interesting point, actually, that there are things to be unhappy with in every browser and which one is taking sort of the brunt changes, right? Yeah. Yeah. 
I don't know. Yes. Like, have you have you experienced that? Oh yeah. I, over the years, there has always been at least one browser that was the most frustrating. And furthest behind is maybe not a fair way to put it anymore. But there was a time that IE six was the best browser on the market, and then there was a time when it wasn't, and it was it gradually became the thing that most people were frustrated by. And I mean, that's where this whole is Safari, the new IE, you know, is right. blah, the new IE comes from. But, uh, you know, I remember the time when the question was, is IE the new Netscape? <laughs> um, right. I, I was actually going to say that. Like, I remember when IE came along and one of the reasons that it was better is because Netscape had gotten so, like, bloated and, yeah. like, slow. And In recent years, there were times when I was most frustrated by Chrome. Which you know most developers will gasp in outrage and uh, at the blasphemy, but it was behind in the areas that I was most interested in. Well, behind mm -hmm. Firefox, right? And they're largely a parody now in the areas that I'm interested in. But um, yeah, there was a there was a period of a couple of years where I was just like, I wish Chrome would catch up already. Yeah. Um, and, and you know they're. But it, it goes the other way too occasionally. Like it, Safari supports hanging punctuation, which is a property in CSS, and no, none of the other browsers do. And it's not a huge thing, but it does occasionally frustrate me that nobody besides Safari supports hanging punctuation. It makes certain typographical things much nicer, makes certain layouts look cleaner when it's supported. Yeah, at some point I was doing a thing where I was making extensive use of hanging punctuation to make it look what I thought was better. And then, you know, what I the first, when I first loaded it up in, I don't know, Firefox or Chrome or whatever else, I was checking it in. I was like, what the? Oh, right. <laughs> I don't support hanging punctuation. Dang. Arr, shake fist at sky. Um, and then move on. But yeah, I mean... And from... I mean, I don't, I don't want to try to say that what Dave had to say can be boiled down to a single sentence, but I think what he's part of what he's getting at there with the, you know, what frustrate me are the things I have to do to appease a single browser God is really, it, it comes back to like compat 2021, right? They're compat problems. They're compat frust compatibility frustrations. And, you know, it's, I could see where a useful bit of feedback for Jen would be if if I were making the, the 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 calls, if I were calling the shots on WebKit, I would say invest everything in catching up with Chrome and Firefox in terms of what they support, so that there are fewer of those frustrations sort of across the board, right? Where where people say, "All right, I did a thing and it works in these two browsers," and then I tried it in the third browser and it didn't work, and I have to figure out how to either, you know do the right incantations to make it work, whether that's a WebKit prefixed property in CSS or it's a, some kind of, you know, I have to write a polyfill or I have to find a polyfill in JavaScript to make the thing that I was doing in JavaScript work for whichever browser isn't supporting that. You know, less of that, I think, would make developers on the whole a good deal happier. In, in, a, in a way, I think... I think probably the deepest frustration is what you, I, you know, we're talking about from the MDN survey and what Dave was getting at, which is compatibility. It's always the biggest frustration, I think. But then also, how do you keep up with that? Um, I, right. That part's not easy. <laughs> it's certainly. Dave's follow-up podcast on the Shop Talk show, they talked about this, you know, his answer to that. And the fact that along the way, when he posted that blog, he learned that, some of his pains were no longer pains anymore. So like he was still, he was still frustrated, right? He was still working around things that he didn't have to work around. Exactly. Right. And, yeah. and like, so yeah. this is part it's, of the fire hose problem, right? Like, uh, how do you know? He, he was like, he was like the driver that kn knows to go around the pothole and keeps doing it even after the pothole's been fixed. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, and how do you keep up? And that gets back to what we were talking about before, right? It would be great if there were a central news bureau that could keep people informed about this, but there isn't. And to some extent, I think that would be very difficult to create. We do this thing with the uh, TC39 has a educators group. We have this two minute standards, uh, standards in two minutes. Right. And, 
it, it tries to do that. Only very, very high signal to noise. We only write about something uh, and tweet about it when there's some development that becomes sort of like serious enough that really all developers should like know about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So we try not to give two years before the thing when it's stage one, Mm -hmm. you know, we try not to add to the fire hose. We say when it becomes pretty real and we write one post and that post has to be 500 words or less or two minutes of video or less. And the idea is like, to make the fire hose sort of manageable. Like if you're drinking your coffee or tea or whatever, your morning ritual where you like scroll through Twitter, (laughs) like if you see one of those tweets, you can open it and you can, you like, you can know I can consume this because it's going to take two minutes of my time. It's not a 45 minute talk or, you know, a blog post that I need to really get in the right space for. It gives you just what you need and then links you to more information so that you can move on with your life for when you actually have that problem, you know where to look and <laughs> what it is. I think there are opportunities for us to do better here, and uh, I'm hopeful that we will come up with some. I've seen some interesting ideas already. Cool. I'm all for it. Okay. I know we've been going on for a long time, and I, I do want to sort of button this up, but there's one last thing I want to mention here to kind of close this out. Um, we talked about compat and prioritization and things. There are efforts to find better ways to like look at what that, is and and measure these things and plan better we have these big compat tables that are generated and kept up to date Uh, they're not perfect but we're doing things to improve that too and some people like paul kindlin at google and philip jegenstein i think most people know him as philip he's former opera now google they've been working on some interesting ways to maybe look at this and visualize it but what's interesting about this is that you can begin to like look at this and when you look at for example css you can see that things are actually like a lot more ragged than this conversation would imply like there's lots of things that are supported by two of three engines and it's not like remotely exclusively right. safari that's lacking them it's not exclusively webkit there is a very non insignificant right. number of things with specs and tests and things that are implemented in zero to one browsers too so i mentioned this not just to be fair but to again stress just how much of this has to do with the fact that we are every team is trying to prioritize limited resources and like the limits are very different, but when Jen or Una or someone asks, like, if you could pick one thing, that that is kind of why every team mm-hmm. would love to do them all, but actually no browser team is as big as it would like to be. And that is one lever that's sort of completely out of their control. Yeah. It strikes me as odd that we talk about resource constraints when it comes to three of the biggest companies in the entire world. <laughs> So for me to even say, hey, what I would do if I were in charge of WebKit is like beef up the staff. I would throw more resources at catching up. Mm -hmm. It's like it's a multi-trillion dollar company. How do they not have those resources already? And yet they don't, right? Browser teams are not the entirety of their companies, even at Google. And Google has a lot more of its business model dependent on the browser than Apple does or Microsoft for that matter. Also interesting thing here that we blow right past in these discussions often is that like as users we we sort of want the investment to be at least as big as the current biggest one and that's really interesting because that's what much of our podcast series has been about sort of the the economics behind it all it's nice i guess to say i wish apple invested more heavily and yeah me too actually uh It seems like they could afford to. Uh, I'm willing to admit that this is not their only priority. And there are plenty of things, if you examined my own finances similarly, that you could say, why don't you spend more money on X? You can totally afford to. But, you know, isn't this a commons that we're building? And wouldn't it be healthy if the system we built to support that made sense for a commons? So uh, if you haven't listened to others, I hope you check them out and find them interesting. Anyway, I'm really glad that we got to do one together. I hope we do more. Let's. Okay, cool. Let's do that. Uh, All right. Thanks. Thank you, sir.